Welcome to Event Tech Talks um, here at Huggletree um, in East Central London um, and our next session of our first Event Tech Talks afternoon. Um, the next session we're going to be looking at how, so how social media giants are tailoring their technology for events. Let's welcome our next panel um, and we warmly welcome, first of all, Nick Morgan from Big Cat Group. Thanks for joining us, Nick. Um, Ian Sullivan from Consorcio. I was told to say it in a Perfect. rich Mediterranean accent. Ian Sullivan from Consorcio. John Sanders from GES. Welcome along, John. Good and afternoon. Madeline Johnson from Blondfish. Good afternoon and welcome to Event Tech Talks. First of all, before we crack on with the subject, we should point out again um, to our audience here and watching via the live stream that a big part of today is the audience participation. We'd like to encourage everybody to interact with our panellists today and put questions to them wherever possible. We're using Glissa, so please feel free to uh, go to the URL that should be on the screen behind me. The URL is glsr.it forward slash tech talk, and you'll be able to interact with the session and put questions to our panellists, which we will answer for you, hopefully, during the session. Also use Twitter with the hashtags LDN Tech Week, hashtag Event Tech Talks, and hashtag Event Tech, L-D-N. Let's move on then with the discussion. Um, social media giants. Um, I I'm not quite sure what the term social media giants is now and, and exactly which social media platforms fall into the category of being a giant, but how are they tailoring their technology? And I think particularly what we're going to look at in this session is the live streaming that's now available via social media platforms. Facebook Live, uh, Periscope, um, using Twitter accounts. Um, YouTube are developing a new live streaming platform that hopefully will enable people to interact with it a little bit um, more fluidly than they have done in the past. So how are things being changed? Who'd like to dive in with this one and perhaps look at how they have used it or where they think social media streaming could be applicable? Um, yeah, if you don't mind, guys, I'll jump in first. So Ian, please it, do. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so uh, my company, by the way, we, we manage social media on behalf of events, so we do things like training and strategy planning for them, and as well as fully managing their social media. So we're kind of lucky that we get this holistic view across uh, events from all over the world and how they, do, how they work, um, and we sort of kind of take the best bits, because um, uh, we never do anything wrong, of course, and um, we got all the best bits, and we share that knowledge. And one of those things that's uh, you know quite topical while we're discussing it today is about the, how the tech giants are actually changing. Yes, they're kind of almost um, you know kind of arrogant in their approach when you when you want want something from them. They're very dictatorial. They will sort of kind of we're rolling this out and we're doing this and we're we're pushing this down. And you kind of have to adapt your event around what's available out there for the, the tools that are available. Um, but essentially, I mean, you know, if you look at the big four, I suppose, if we're looking at the big social media events like uh, social media uh, platforms like uh, Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and YouTube, they are beginning to understand by a pure definition that events and conferences are a collection of like-minded individuals who come together to share knowledge. And social media, by its definition, is a group of like-minded individuals who come together and share knowledge. And so those two things go really hand in glove. And they're beginning to understand how to sort of um, orchestrate and bring together um, technology um, in their platforms to make it more dynamic um, within the social media spectrum in your events. And um, I think we're going to talk a little bit later about all the different details of that. But they are actually beginning to pay attention and move in that direction, which is, is really good news. Um, Nick, you perhaps come at it from a, maybe a slightly different angle. You mentioned meetings, conferences and things. But when we're talking about it perhaps in a... Uh, an outdoor setting and out, outdoor greenfield events, um, have we already seen good examples of how those platforms have already shaped what the audience behaviour is like? Uh, yeah, I think one of the things we're concerned about, and most we, we deliver about 30 to 40 festivals uh, a season, hence the reason I look so old today, uh, but it is that there's IP to protect. Unlike conferencing and some experiential campaigns, People are obsessed about reach, you know, brands are obsessed about getting reach, so everyone talks about hybrid events, so not just the activity or the activation happening, it's the bigger audience, so example being today, you know, there'll be a massive reach happening externally to this room, whereas in festivals there's, there's lots of reasons, you know, protect, uh, to protect that IP, so obviously one is bands and agents, you can't just start streaming uh, their sets, you can with massive negotiated costs. 
And then in addition to that, it's protecting the experience. You know, the danger being is if we keep going down this route of streaming everything, you know, the content, and Glastonbury is a great example of this. So with the BBC, you know, they, there's a whole experience that sits outside Glastonbury. Glastonbury being the, the engine that it is can already sustain that ticket volume, whereas some of the other festivals, you know, when you start streaming externally at the, the quality the BBC are doing, for example, on the red button, uh, it could potentially start affecting commercial sales. You know, it's not only the door revenue, there's all the sponsorship revenue, and that's driven on footfall, bar sales. These are all absolutely essential to the success of a festival industry. Streaming something through Periscope delivers no revenue currently. I'm sure it will do through advertising channels potentially later, uh, but to the festival organiser and promoter. So th there is this, and they are building in things like latency. I've seen that on conferencing platforms as well, where they'll have speakers and there's a latency built in, so you can't actually activate that content until later on, which hopefully then doesn't stem audience from attending those events. Let's bring it across the other side of the table today and, and bring in Madeline and, and John. John, when you look at the social media platforms um, that, that people have been engaging with now for a number of years, really, people are all are very much familiar with them. How has the live streaming element, uh, uh, element changed what you guys are doing at GES? It's an interesting question, actually, in terms of the idea of live streaming. Um, traditionally, in a beta beat, like, we deliver 7,000 events in 42 countries every year. Traditionally, when we're looking at a live streaming, uh, it, it's about that conference speaker slot environment. So it's very much a controlled environment. A lot of our clients are quite nervous of user-generated content around that in a live environment because it, you're looking at lack of brand control. We work in some sectors like healthcare. And Just come right on top of that mic. OK. Is that better? That's perfect. So we work in sectors like healthcare, defence, financial services. We're actually a lot of the information that, that's exchanged within that environment is confidential. And there's lots of issues around that. So it tends to be very um, focused around specific elements of it, not a lot of user-generated content. When you get outside of those, it's an interesting, on a, on a more general point, is this idea of content as the modern landfill. Is that actually, there's lots and lots and lots out there. So. You're asking the engage, your audience to engage, but by the same token, actually, not all of it's great. So mm. what does that do to your brand in a more general sense? Absolutely. Um, Madeline, I don't know if you've got a, a view on this next one. And correct, if anybody in the audience wants to correct me, feel free. But I'm sure it was the Mayweather-Pacquiao fight in Las Vegas, or certainly in the USA, that generated massive pay-per-view uh, figures for people paying to watch the match. But then some guy stood up in the audience with his phone and on Periscope just stuck the, the fight live on Periscope. Um, is there a danger when we look at that down to our own events here that there are times, as John points out, where we actually don't want people to be streaming and we've got to be careful what access and how we're, we're promoting it as an industry? I think you've got to think about the relevance of these tools to particular events anyway. I think that... Um, the same evaluation that's happened with social media in general applies to these as well. And you might think that you want to jump on the bandwagon and use these because they're getting loads of PR exposure and these are the great new things. But actually, if you don't have an audience in that realm, then you're kind of utilizing something in the wrong context. So I think there's always been a risk once um, people have been able to kind of take control of media which social media has kind of democratized more than we've ever seen before, that people might not turn up to your events, they might not pay a ticket, they might not leave their office, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you've got a responsibility, as always, to create fantastic content and to provide the tools for those audience members who are creating user-generated content to make it compelling and, and give people a reason to, to still turn up or really, really maximize that horizon outside the live event um, by getting that fantastic reach and amplification and engagement beyond the live space. Is the development of, of the live streaming within social media platforms being driven by the social media platforms themselves identifying events as a way of increasing their reach and their users, 
or have events engaged with social media platforms to say we could do with live streaming? Who's driving who with this? I think it would be kind of nice to think that social media platform owners and developers are waking up in the morning and thinking, oh, those event peeps do cool stuff. Let's create a whole new collection of tools for them to use specifically. I think it's much more about us as event people co-opting these tools and using them in the right ways, in the right contexts. Obviously, you know, we've got this fantastic face-to-face -face engaging environment and, and we can use these fantastic tools to extend that rather than the other way around, from my perspective. From your own experiences, is, is, is any one of them doing it better than the others for your own particular event purposes? Would you, if you were put on the spot, would you instantly gravitate towards one? Well, I think, that, yeah, excuse me, I think that depends on your event, really. Um, so the first thing you need to do is pro <coughs> profile your event and have a look at your demographic, sociographic, who you're trying to reach and how you're trying to reach them. And then you have to look at your content. Um, if you've got a lot of video and you've got a lot of um, pictures and stuff, then you know Twitter's probably not the right one and LinkedIn certainly is not the right one for you to sort of look at. So you really have to do a little bit of in-house work first to see, sort of see which one is doing it best um, because that's too much of a generic question. Um, you need to look at who you're trying to approach and what you're trying to achieve and those targets from that. So, you know, they've all done their own little thing like Twitter. You can archive off lists and things so you can put your speakers in lists and your exhibitors and, and your, your delegates if you so wish to. Uh, you, you know, you can privatise things on LinkedIn in, within groups. So if you so wish to have a top 100 people or something within your event, then you can put them in there. Facebook have groups, of course, um, that you, you can have as private groups. So they've all got these little things that you, you can use, but it really does depend on, on you, and it really does depend on what you're trying to achieve as an event and what your objectives are, um, which will determine which is the best tool for you to use. I think just in addition to that as well, it's really important, obviously, is the audience you're trying to attract to. So Snapchat, for example, at the moment, you know, it's huge in a certain demographic. A lot of younger people, teenagers, millennials are using Snapchat. Obviously, they're not so engaged in things like LinkedIn. So it's also about the audience and the platform, you know, you're trying to attract. They all have different audiences. You know, Facebook now, there's a massive decline in... Uh, what can be termed as like the hipsterville. A lot of people are going to really aspirational branded content events, aren't interested in Facebook. There's a decline in those people engaging on those platforms. So I think, you know, also knowing who you're trying to attract, because obviously it's a great marketing channel as well to get audience to those type of events. Yeah, d I think there is a, a real difference between B2C and B2B as well. I yeah. think it'd be interesting to know what the audience both here and, 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 and remotely thinks. Uh, but when I talk to brands, there's two platforms that they, they already engage with and are immediately talking to me about. That's LinkedIn and that's Twitter. And that's how they see arrange, uh, engaging around an exhibition or a conference or a congress or a summit. And they see very much those. But they tend to see them often uh, separate. Um, they use them around an event specifically, but they don't really think of that ongoing customer narrative as well. So it's like, well, the event's over. I'll push out some stuff afterwards, and it ends. Um, Periscope, I think, potentially is an interesting one around that, around linked into Twitter, and we'll see more of that. Um, be interesting to see if, what Microsoft does with uh, LinkedIn as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. I think that's really interesting in terms of how they engage around that and the power that they'll bring to that. On the, on, on the subject of Twitter, uh, 303 million users, yet Periscope only has 20 million, mm -hmm. because in order to access the live streaming element, element of Twitter, you have to then go to a completely separate platform in order to do that. Yet Facebook, since integrating the live Facebook uh, element into all of the mobile devices, they have 1.6 billion active users, which essentially means they have 1.6 billion people who have instant access via their Facebook accounts. Is this a, a really big trick that Twitter have missed here by actually going to a separate platform in order to do their live streaming? And eventually, are we going to have to see them move some sort of live streaming element into the native Twitter app? Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> firstly, um, statistics and stuff always. Uh, I'm a little bit cynical of them when I come down from social media giants because at the end of the day, their, their ultimate goal is to make money. Um, and so if they can wave 1.6 billion in front of you rather than 20 million, I think you know where you're going to spend your advertising revenue. So, um, but no, generally, you, you, you're right. I mean, uh, it's, it sounds like to me that Periscope has sort of kind of 
probably pulled a fast one on Twitter, if, if my honest opinion with it, you know, because they wanted obviously to sort of kind of maybe break it away and even probably sell it as a separate part. So um, it could be a, a, an opportunity um, for other, other companies to do something similar. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm guessing um, they probably have missed a trick with it, but I'm sure they're, they haven't got the reach that Facebook's got at the moment. Um, and they never had. Um, so it's something they're probably looking at for the smaller audience and something more to engage with. I'm sure they've also done a lot of research. I wouldn't know, I'm not privy to it, of course, but I'm sure they've looked at their data of their users and the demographic profile of their users and seen who would use that kind of thing and, um, and probably targeted it that way. Does, does Twitter's announcement that they were, they'd acquired the rights to show, um, I think it was 10 live NFL uh, matches over in the States from next season via Twitter. Does that change how then other, not just sporting events, Nick, but other sort of live events, sporting, music, whatever they may be, does, it, does that now change the game a little bit in terms of how they look at the broadcast element? You mentioned there are certain things that you can't just stick up on a live stream, but does that change how some of these live events may deal with broadcasters full stop? Yeah, I think, you know, they've already been dealing with uh, media rights for years and years, but it's just working out the commercial arrangement. Um, you know, Glastonbury, I keep using that as an example just because it's this weekend. Uh, however, you know, there's lots of experiential uh, companies going there filming. I, I know two companies are doing using the new 360 camera and, you know, the amount of IP that has to be protected to allow you know, them to come and film. I mean, basically, they can't film uh, any of the stages, any of the branding that sits around the stages. It's all got to be centred around audience participation and engagement. So how interesting that is, it is still to be discovered. Uh, but I think, you know, there is a danger uh, of that because with the large events that we produce, it is all around the experience. It's not just about what happens on stage. Uh, and then when you start getting audiences thinking, oh, I don't want to go and sit in a muddy field, for example, uh, I can just see this at home, or then, you know, in the bigger things where Sky will come in, probably, or some broadcaster, where it's broadcast in theatres or in pubs, at some point, you know, there is a danger that that is going to really affect, uh, you know, promoters and some of their revenues. You know, unless broadcasters are going to start paying huge rights, which I, I know that already exists in the sporting world, but in terms of uh, promoting and big concerts, it, it's fairly in its infancy at the moment in terms of like festivals, uh, concerts are streamed uh, already. But so, you know, my concern is trying is losing this experience. You know, of being in a field, it's almost you know something that people do. It, it's a rite of passage in life is to go to a festival. You know, and it's all of those, you know, meeting people, the friends, the one-to-one -one interactions, whereas, you know, it could become quite soulless is the danger. And, you know, some of these bigger shows, some of the really big festivals, which are seen as very commercial, are already losing audience and are really struggling to sell, um, you know, to, to sell tickets. You know, so I think some of those will dissipate in the next few years. How careful do we have to be then, guys, in terms of identifying when and how any of this live streaming element is, is applicable. And when it comes back to the fact that everyone potentially has access to it, um, what does it mean for event organizers in terms of making sure that they're retaining audiences and continuing to develop content that actually attracts people there rather than via a live stream? I'll answer that one. Um, context, relevancy. Social media used well around events. It does, there is that FOMO factor, that fear of missing out. Um, it does help you raise awareness and drive traffic. And actually, we, look, we work with both event owners and participants in events. So we're looking at exhibitors at trade shows. So there's an opportunity for you to use social media to make yourself one of the hubs of a, of a large trade show. Make your brand the brand experience of that show. Uh, which can really help, and live streaming is, is another way of giving that buzz and that touch and feel that text doesn't do, and still imagery doesn't do. Um, so you can do that. You can use it to trail um, conference speakers before they come on, particularly those um, 
in a stand environment from Bechner or a booth environment, when you've got short demos, etc., you can use that to engage with those speakers around pre immediately prior to that coming on. So you're starting to, to give the audience some context around the event and, and, and drive that traffic through them. Um, so again, it's all about augmenting that experience, isn't it? It's the stuff that we talk about in text and in terms of uh, still imagery. Uh, it's another tool to communicate message and brand, and, and that's a good thing. It's about how and when we use it, as we say, and that's appropriate in a different way to a different client in a different context. Uh, and just on that, I think you know the other thing we're missing is it is not just about what happens externally to the event, but it can enhance an experience. So whilst yes. you're at something like a big festival, you can't get to every single stage, you know. And there are Very lots of people using it really well now, you know, like DJs backstage interviews, things like that. So it can enhance a user's experience actually on site. And I'd love to see that balloon yeah. uh, because you know, standing at the back with ninety thousand people, how good is that experience, yeah. you know? It's an interesting one, because traditionally when we, we talk to clients, when they think about social media and live streaming, it tends to be about, um, live stream particularly, is about the external audience. I can't get to the event, how do I engage with that audience that can't get there? But actually, there's a real opportunity to make that experience richer for the, for the attendees in and around the event. And, is. Sorry, and it Madeline. needs to be yeah. a conversation, doesn't it? So this is a great opportunity for you to engage with the people who are proactive with these tools. And that maybe gives you a little bit more control about some of that user-generated content. So if you are able to name drop and provide exciting content and give them a reason to engage with you as the source of... Um, or the kind of hub of that, um, then I think that you're able to kind of lead the way a little bit more. We should just, uh, I'm going to interject at this point and just remind uh, audience both here and watching via the live stream about uh, the Glissa feed. Um, there should be a link to it on the screen of the, uh, the live stream and on the screen behind me to put your questions. We have got some questions coming in which we're going to put shortly. Um, and in fact, let, let's dive in with that, that question. How do, how do you create engagement with a small budget? But realistically, if somebody's got one of these, surely they can just get themselves on a Wi-Fi network or a 4G network, stick it on a tripod, and away we go. It's, um, if you don't mind, it's a good question for me to answer because it's what we do for a living. Um, often, you know, events come to us. We run events as small as sort of 50 people like this, uh, right up to 60,000 people um, attending um, uh, an event we do in Amsterdam in September. And it's all about relevancy of content. You, you all want, if you all run events or you're involved in event, eventing, then you, um, it, you want to be a thought leader. You want to be somewhere where somebody says, yeah, I want to go to that event because something's there. They're fourth, they're fourth thinkers. They're, they're thinking in front of it and they're coming up with news mm -hmm. and information that no one else is doing. So that's why I want to attend that event. That's the attraction. So the content that you generate around that has to be relevant and it has to be um, timely and it has to be for the right context. So you need to grab that, that information. It's not as easy as saying you've got you know, very little budget and well, I want to conquer the world. That's, that's just not reality and it's not gonna happen. We all know these things have got a price, but we do work with companies and small organizations that do have a very small budget. And what we do to them or do for them and what we ask them to help them to do is, is to bring relevant content to the table. Now that could be primary content. It could be stuff which we call gold dust, really, which is the stuff the event is generating. So, you know, keynote speakers, someone was mentioning, uh, sponsors, um, venue even, you know, and it's stuff that you, you're, you've got that's coming from you. But that's really hard to do on a day-to-day -day basis and to keep that thought leadership going. And you'll run out of that content pretty quick, regardless of who you are. So you need to start doing some work in regards to what we call secondary content and tertiary content, which is looking at stuff that's relevant to your industry or relevant to your event and how that's going to become in dynamic and how that's going to start a conversation or start sparking interest with your social media feeds. So you can do it cheaply, but you do need to put the resource of a bit of effort into doing that. I think as well, you need to think about how you're going to maximise it, don't you? So you need to repurpose, you need to make sure you're talking to people at the right time. You need to make sure that you're engaging and extending your network. So following people, getting them to follow you, giving them a reason to follow you and making sure that once you have 
gone to the effort of creating content that you then extend it through maybe in the same exact format, maybe in other formats, through as many channels as possible so that you can really get the most bang for your buck. I wouldn't like to comment on the quality of this content, but I do know that we're trending second on Twitter at the moment with the hashtag Event Tech Talk. Must so be, must be you. Yeah. <laughs> let, 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 let's bump it up. I'm curious. I take back my comment about digital landfill. <laughs> I, 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 I'm curious to move on. When we talk about budgets and, and how can we do it, perhaps on a tight budget, um, is the is the subject of quality. Um, we're fortunate enough today to have uh, Richard and his team from First Sight Media with some superb top-of-the-line equipment, some great cameras, it's all going into fabulous digital mixers and vision mixers and being fed out on a live stream. Um, but when somebody can do it on their mobile device as well, does the quality of the picture and of the audio really matter if they're able to engage with quality content? Or could the quality of doing it via a small mobile device actually devalue what you're live streaming. So I suppose what I'm asking is, when is it appropriate to use the stuff we've got in our pockets, and when is it appropriate to bring in guys like this to do your live stream for you? And the answer is sometimes, sometimes. Sometimes that's appropriate, sometimes that's appropriate. Depends on the messaging and the content and what you want to use it for. If you've got um, a conference for 3,000 people and you've got high, uh, keynote speakers and you're trying to communicate that to an, a, a that entire presentation to a global audience, then actually you need a level of quality and, and uh, that delivers that. If you're delivering Vox Pops around an event and you want nice little short pieces of content, actually that works really, really well. And mm. actually it's much more engaging and usable than, than, than putting someone in front of a camera and saying, right, give me a five second piece of why this event is great. Madeline, did you have any, any thoughts on the quality or the or the lack thereof that may occur when you're using some of the really accessible devices to actually put what is quite high-end content? Obviously, all of these kind of streaming tools like Periscope and Facebook Live and even Snapchat you know, are mainly targeted at user-generated content. So when you're putting together an amazing event like this, they're wonderful extra um, engagement and, and extension of the information, but they're certainly not going to be um, probably good enough unless you've got a really nice tripod and a really good camera and you'll probably have some skills in actually capturing video. The reality is that you do need something that's more robust, more reliable. These are underpinned by fantastic platforms. You're going to get the content in a way that allows you to then really properly extend the event horizon. So I think to echo what John says, you know, it is just a case of context. An Inter uh, interesting point, uh, though, oh, actually. Sorry. sorry. Go on, Nick. Uh, yeah, just uh, John mentioned earlier about the fear of loss. So at the moment, when it's user-generated, it's almost like a marketing tool, and a fear of loss is a great thing from an event's large festival site because quality isn't quite good enough. Uh, to be streamed you know, to a global audience. It's more people uh, getting brand awareness around what a great event it was, and people can basically get the feeling and the sense of what it was like to be there, and they missed out, and hopefully that will generate a ticket sale for the following year. However, when it does get much, much better, you know, IP is going to be a big issue. If you can you know, stream Kings of Leon set live to a global audience sat in the audience, uh, which used to happen with piracy in the 80s in cinemas where everyone used to sell dodgy copies in local pubs. You know, if that starts happening, I think you know, there could be a different conversation about how you commercialise. My point was going to be, it's not just about the technology. Uh, like us all here, I'm told modern cameras can take fantastic imagery. I can't do it. And I'm sure most of, the, most of the people in this audience and globally are the same. So actually, it's not just about the tech. It's about our ability to use it. Yeah. Um, so well, on that note, and people's ability to use it, um, yesterday, I think there, there was a, a, a story that went up on Event Industry News um, regarding Glastonbury and their partnership with EE and putting in what's one of the, the, the world's biggest temporary 4G networks for Glastonbury this year. So is there an acceptance? And I'm, I'll sort of look at you a little bit, Nick, because I know that you come from that, that part of the world. But is there an acceptance now from event organisers as a whole that with the better connectivity that we now have, there is going to be stuff that's going to go out there and we may as well, if you can't beat them, join them. Give them the network, let them stream stuff, let them put content onto social media and 
let's be part yeah, of like, it. Yeah, back really to reiterate what, what I was just uh, talking about. You know, at the moment, the quality, th like through platforms like Periscope and off your phone, uh, you know, like John said, I can't film a, a particularly good concert or an experience. So at the moment, it, it's a marketing tool, is, ha is how I see it. You know, the problem maybe comes later on, you know, they can all upload, it's great. So yeah, they're getting a global audience, you know, they're sh sharing amongst their social advocacy and their network, saying how great it is. Basically, you should be here, is the message that's going out there. That's generating ticket revenue, that's brilliant. You know, that, that is something that all promoters want. Um, but when it gets really good quality and we have this ability in the next generation or generation after of camera equipment or phones where, you know, people start to make that decision, do I attend or do I not attend? Because all of my social advocacy or network, they're going to be there anyway. I can just sit at home or I can sit in a, another environment and see it and therefore I don't need to <coughs> attend. You know, that, that's where I, I think... There could be we come back to that, those fundamentals of who we are as event people, which is actually, events aren't just about content though, are they? It's, you were yeah. talking about it earlier, Nick, it's about that 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 face-to-face -face engagement, about yeah. having those conversations, about having those interactions. None of that can be replicated by live streaming or any kind of social media content in quite the same way. Um, well, I think, to go back you know, to what your point was about, you know, should we embrace it? I, I, sort of, I, I had a meeting uh, only last week about that very discussion. And it was about um, uh, live streaming. And the idea was, you know, well, instead of trying to stop people live streaming, because this particular event had delegates and were paying an awful lot of money to go to the event, and the last thing they want to do is just turn up and realise, why have I paid £2,000 to go to this event when someone's streaming it live? Um, but they were saying, well, why don't we embrace it? Why don't we, why don't we start putting that in? And then they come across the dilemma of actually the event itself, the, the, uh, the hall where it, or the whole st uh, stand where it was being shown didn't have the quality of um, internet uh, connectivity. So they, they were then <laughs> in a quandary of, well, if we actually sell this and promote it for the exhibitors that they can do live streaming on their stands and we can do live streaming of interviews and stuff, and we're selling that as a package, and it doesn't deliver, it fouls because of the network, mm. then that becomes counterproductive. So It does, yeah. You yeah. Know. And that goes back to, 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 to the, the first session that we did today about changing the attendee experience. And if you don't do it right, if you, if you deploy a technology that doesn't, subsequently doesn't work for you, you're going to actually create a negative experience, mm. aren't you? I think you need to make it easy for people who do want to engage with these things, though. So to try and hinge it back into a more general social media message and a general event message, you know, you're going to have people there, particularly in a B2B context, but we do a lot of experiential as well, and obviously you've got some very engaged consumers. So let them do it if you're going to, and give them the tools to do it. So tell them what the Wi-Fi network is, and tell them what all the hashtags are, and encourage them, and engage with them, and respond to them, and retweet them, and extend their content, because you go to a lot of events. I'm sure, you know, we work in event technology, and it's astonishing the number of events I go to that are about event technology that don't do that very thing. So I think, you know, Wi-Fi is becoming a hygiene factor. If you can, provide a Wi-Fi network at your event no matter what and make it free and make all of that other information available for all of the social networks so that people can get the message out there and make use of it. Let, let's go over um, to some questions that have come in via Glissa, via people interacting with us today. Um, have we seen the rise of the social networks and this is as good as it's going to get or are there any new social media apps coming onto the market that could benefit specifically event businesses? Are there yet to be discovered platforms out there? Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was easy answered. Um, yeah, I mean, look, the conversations we're having today, if we were to have this in three months' time, it would be a different conversation. It moves that fast. That being said, um, the AV guys, I wouldn't panic or anything about live streaming at the moment. Personally, I don't think that I see um, your world diminishing uh, considerably <laughs> because somebody's going to uh, periscope a, a film, a, 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 a concert or something. I still think there's that element of quality. But to go back to the question, it's, the landscape changes all the time. I mean, I'm, I, I live and breathe social media in, in a business sense um, and talk to clients every day, um, all week, for the last six years about it and attend events and do talks like these. And I still, I still get people coming up to me and going, have you heard of this? And I'm like, no. So you have to go away and kind of research it. There's things popping up all the time. There's absolutely thousands of them. The advice I give to that 
is don't you know don't just get consumed by everything don't sort of look at everything and go my god i need to be on every platform and i need to be doing this it goes right back to what we were saying at the beginning about it really you really need to profile your event and understand who you're trying to um, attract and what sort of things you're trying to do and you try to do too much and you bite off too much and it will all fail i've seen that happen so so just do it in moderation um let's look at let's take another one from glisser um Will social media eventually swallow up the event app, making them redundant? In theory, could we just use an event page or a page for your event on Facebook to replace your app? I think the answer to that is probably no. Uh, it's, it's a narrative that we heard around the internet all those years ago. Events are going to die. No one's going to need to engage around an event. Things change, people develop new stuff. There'll always be niches and developments that'll mean that there's always a, there's, there'll be a place in the market for all these things, whether it's an app, whether it'll be something completely different in uh, 15 years. But it's not necessarily going to be the major platforms that, that deliver that. Madeline, there was a furious shake of the head. I just, I, I used to work for an event app company, and I think that in the right context, they're fantastic. But I think people also need to recognize you don't always need one of those either. So I think you can get some very, very active social media voices in your community, but you also might have plenty of people who aren't using that. So I completely agree with John and the rest of the panel, I'm sure, on the fact that social media won't swallow up event apps. But I think it's very, very important when you are considering event apps to really think about the kinds of features and functionality that you want to have in place and really, really leveraging them. because. It's all very well to have a nice floor plan and an exhibitor list and pay a lot of money to have that and, and not have anyone download it. So I think it's, it's really always thinking about the right tool for the right purpose and not thinking that you have to have an event app or that you have to be on Facebook. If you're in a B2B world, you probably don't have to be on Facebook. I, I've never, never come across an event company that's come up to me and said, um, we're, gonna put your, we're gonna give you the budget rather than the event app. Um, or vice versa. Um, they, they're two mutually exclusive tools, in my opinion. Um, and the information that we give out on social media for our clients is is different to the stuff that goes on the event app and, and what's being done there. So up to now, in my experience, I'd say they're completely different. We're going to hand over in just a second to questions from the audience. So if anybody has got a question that they want to put using the microphone to our audience, put your hand in the air. We'll come to you in just a moment so we can get the mics into position. So pop your hand in the air if you've got one. Let's take one more question from Glisser very quickly before we go to the audience. Um, live streaming surely creates a fear of missing out, therefore a drive in, want to, a drive in wanting to be there, and in turn, ticket sales increase for the following year. An example has been given here where Coachella, the sales have increased since... 2011's live stream. So I think it goes back to the point that you were making, perhaps, Nick, about it being a marketing tool and it actually being used properly to drive people wanting to come to the live event. Yeah, and, it, and a lot of that is down to the quality that's currently accessible. So, you know, you know, for current platforms, it, it is creating that fear of loss and it's demonstrating just what a great experience it is and the unification of people being there and in there with their social friends and family. Um, you know, my only sort of caveat is that as technology advances, you know, are we going to see uh, people deciding not to go because the quality that's coming out, you know, it isn't there. And this isn't relevant for all audiences. You know, I use the word, you know, Glastonbury again, it sells out within 42 minutes. It's the fastest selling festival on earth. So therefore, they haven't got that danger. I'm talking about lots of the smaller events we work with, with 5,000, 10,000 people, they're trying to grow their audience. You know, if there starts to be a competitive element where everything's getting streamed, it, it's basically in parallel and it could suppress that audience because everyone goes, oh, it's all about gate revenue. It's not just about gate revenue. We need people to attend festivals because the gate revenue often just pays for the event. You know, festivals cost a lot of money. It's the, the other revenues, the commercial revenues coming through bars, coming through sponsorship deals, they are imperative. And obviously sponsors, if you go to them and say we've lost 90% of our audience, are very unlikely to participate in that event, regardless of the audience that's being you know, projected online. Um, so, yeah. Let's, uh, let's go to a question from the audience. The gentleman at the back there, if you could uh, give us your name and organization, please. Absolutely. Yeah, my name's Matt Wilson. I work for a company called D2I Systems. And it's a, a bit of an open question to the, to the panel. Uh, the question being, it's almost taking the, uh, the buying Eventbrite question one step further. 
uh, social media platforms have been very, very good with big data and arguably probably a lot better than organizers are. Is there a danger as an industry we've probably opened the door to the wolf coming through um, and actually taking over the position of the organizer themselves as they have access to all the, all the data, all the trends, and probably more regular access to the markets that the event organizer would traditionally use to create an event? So uh, it's, it's perhaps the, the question, are we in danger of Facebook using the data that they've got to just say, we'll make our it, event. Let's, our, let's do our own event. We know who the people are, where they're going, and what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, not to do them a disservice, uh, but in terms of actually organising an event, a large-scale event, there's an awful lot that goes into it. I, I, you know, if Facebook were to go down that route, you know, it would be a branded content event, I imagine, and lots of brands and briefs that we see now are FMCGs coming to us saying we want to own the market is no longer necessarily the benefit to be, say, second stage sponsor. Um, you know, we, we've got the audience. We speak to 10 million people over the monthly period. Why can't we develop our own content? But they would still procure that out to hopefully event specialists like the fair, like us, or any of these other <laughs> fine panelists. Um, but it's really, you know, I think that would be a, a step away. They may have the data and the data, being able to segment the data and get the reach to that audience. But in terms of delivering the actual content in an event, that would be. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's right. I, think, I totally agree. I mean, um, the data that we can mine now from the social media um, platforms give insight. Um, so they're actually, I mean, if, if we think the whole process through logically, if Facebook went around every business and took all that IP and that data and started up their own stuff, they wouldn't have anything to sell to anybody. So essentially, um, the events, really, they're trying to help them. So if they can come to to use your Glastonbury case study over and over use your capacity case study. If they can come to Glastonbury and just actually say to them, actually from the, the profile of data that we've got, we actually know the age demographic, the geographic uh, area of where these people come from, how much their income is, what you can attract, how much you can put the ticket price up so they don't sell at 43 minutes. They take a little bit longer to sell. And I think that's what we're finding. We, we've had an uh, experience last year where a, um, a long-standing event company we was working with um, actually use Facebook and Twitter data to understand where they was going to operate their new show. So they wanted to understand where their most followers were, where people were engaging, what part of the market in the international market they, they, they weren't covering at the time. And we actually supplied them data from their Facebook page and their Twitter feed, which gave them that insight. Uh, and I know that, that Spotify have worked with the uh, Foo Fighters record company recently to actually release certain elements of data related to how many people have streamed their particular tracks in order for the Foo Fighters record company and the Foo Fighters as a band to, to directly target the people who've listened most or streamed the most to their music. And uh, I think creeping in slowly are also elements of the streaming platforms working, working with some of the ticketing companies to actually yeah. release some of that data. And perhaps that's a scenario where some of the social media platforms now will maybe start to work with the larger event companies to look at where that interaction has come from and actually releasing some of that data, do we think? Yeah, obviously a big Foo Fighters fan, I take it. Um, <laughs> no, that's absolutely right. And then you can get into complementary products as well. So, you know, if you, you're mining that sort of data and you're doing events and you're just trying to understand what's happening, that data that's coming back from the, the, the feedback you're getting back from the social media platforms will help you to put something different. There might be an element of your show that people actually want that you've never thought of before, but you're getting that information from who you're profiling. So you could maybe experiment with certain things, whether... You know, it's as basic as uh, something like a Twitter wall at an event or whether it's something as big as actually opening up a whole new hall about something else that may be uh, um, generated around different content. We've, uh, we've got plenty of questions coming in, but I'm quite conscious of time and quite conscious that there may be quite a, an opportunity here for the guys on the panel to, to answer questions directly with some of our audience members here today and for people to collar them and a little bit of networking before we start the next session this afternoon. So what I think we're going to do is bring this to an end, um, let everybody have a little bit of a break who's in the audience this afternoon, and for the guys who have been on the panel in this particular session to go and answer any of the questions face-to-face. Um, and get you, uh, get you out with the audience. We should thank, let's go around the panel first of all. Please give your thanks from the Big Cat Group to Nick Morgan, Ian Sullivan from Consorzio, John Sanders, GES, thanks for joining us this afternoon, and Madeline Johnson from Blondfish. This has been the second session of this afternoon's Event Tech Talks. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.